Uh, I work at Netflix, and at Netflix we have a lot of data pipelines. Um, big data pipelines that, that do anything from ETL to building machine learned models to lots of different things. And the one thing that we've found more than anything is that there's no one solution that, that fixes all of the problems, nothing, nothing that does everything. Uh, everybody has their own personal preferences. Uh, some developers might like one thing. Um, I prefer Pigpen, but it can't do everything. Um, Spark is the new hotness. Uh, everybody seems to love that these days. Same with Docker. Um, sometimes you want more abstraction. Sometimes you want the, the map reduce thing. Sometimes you want less. Like with the Docker image, you just want, hey, give me a machine to do stuff, you know? Um, the Hadoop variants, you know, they're, they're old, but they, they do their job and they, they can handle a lot of data. And there's new exciting stuff like uh, Onyx that we heard about earlier. So, what we had at Netflix was a lot of pipelines built using different hybrid technologies, and they were all kind of duct taped together. You might have a bash script or something to, to glue these together, and it was impossible to reason about. So we built something, instead of trying to compete with these and, and do all of the things, we, we built something to help put these together in a sane way. And that's what Dagobah is. The DAG is for directed acyclic graph. <laughs> So talk a little bit about the motivation. Uh, we wanted data-centric pipelines. Uh, a lot of the workflow tools that are out there today uh, are more about execute a series of steps. Um, they don't really know that they're producing data. Um, we have data. We're producing data. Let's see if we can get that into the mix a little bit more. Uh, we want predictability. If I run it multiple times, I want the same thing. I want the same result. I want to know where that result came from. So if I have a wonky piece of data that I produced a week ago and all of a sudden I'm like, crap, what, what happened there? You know, I want to know what the input data to that was, what code ran on that. Um, and importantly, I want structural sharing. Uh, and this one is important because a lot of times we have a big pipeline. I just want to change one part of it. I don't have to rerun the whole thing. Obviously, we want fine-grained computations. We want basically a bunch of pure functions, data in, data out. <clears throat> makes stuff easy to test. Like I said earlier, we want to use a bunch of different uh, technologies, different resources, uh, and be able to stitch those all together. One thing that I'm not a fan of is going into a UI and, and clicking a thousand times to modify something or making systematic changes via UI. So one of the, the design things for this is we wanted it to be, you change something and check it in. Uh, and that communicates with an API. We'll get into that a little bit more later. And most importantly, we need resilience. Resilience, resilience, resilience. Stuff fails all the time. Stuff fails daily. Um, we need to be able to pick up where we left off um, and reason about that. Um, there's often delays. We don't want everything to fall apart while we're waiting for, for data. Uh, and we want to be able to, to restart our workflows in a sane way. So before looking specifically at Dagobah, let's look at a traditional workflow uh, and what those are good for, and that'll help to, to drive why uh, Dagobah is a little bit different. So traditional workflow, you have a start, you do some things. Um, this will be good for like deploying a cluster uh, into the cloud. So you start, it might be like a trigger or your build finished or something like that, and then we'll, we'll bake an image and then we'll deploy it and scale it up might run some tests and then scale down the old cluster, and then maybe send the user an email or something like that. Traditional workflows are going to be good at like branching out in this direction. So you might have something in here that says, all right, in this stage, I'm going to look at the current state of the world, and based on the current state of the world, I'm going to take this path or that path. So they branch out in this direction really well. You can make decisions. And you, you can further that branching. So we go out to here and say, all right, now I'm going to make another decision. So in this case, you start at the same place, but you might have multiple different outcomes from this workflow. Where it gets a little bit sticky is if you start adding more starts. Like, what does this, what does this mean now? I mean, you could kind of say, you know, we'll run both of these first, and when they're both done, then we do the second, second layer and then continue on. Yeah, that makes sense. What about this? What, what do you do when you have something like that? Like, do I run the third one, 
optimistically in case that I took that branch and you know like it, it's difficult to reason about stuff like that in a regular workflow setup. But you can still cram a data workflow into that and they often look like this because we have a lot of different pieces of data and a data workflow is generally you're going to take a piece of data here and a piece of data here, maybe process it and then smash them together and create some other result. And then you're going to take some more data and smash it together and create another result. And so that's kind of where we ended up before is you have a bunch of different starting points uh, and kind of one result, the, the model or whatever data you want to produce at the end. And we can still kind of reason our way through how we would run such a thing. You know, you can slice these off and say, we'll run all the top ones first. You know, that, that makes sense. Um, then once those are done, we can run the next one and so on and so forth. If you're paying attention, you could probably notice, you could probably start running this one on the left here after the top two are done without waiting for the one on the right. Not all workflow managers actually even do that. Uh, they, they don't take advantage of the async nature of these things and knowing that those two steps are decoupled. Uh, PIG is a good example of this. Internally, PIG, if it has multiple stages, will block on uh, the, the right one before it continues. But even if we can run these things, you know, we, we can reason about this and we can, we, can we can build a data workflow using these tools. Where it really starts to get sticky is when you change one of these things. What happens when I change this node? So there's a couple of different variations of this. So let's start with, you know, I have this workflow and I want to try something different for that one. So do I take and do I copy the whole workflow and then just change that and now I have another named copy of this and I have to run that. Um, does uh, rerunning that, is that going to rerun the whole left hand side? Uh, when I rerun this, will that result overwrite an existing production data? Uh, do I have to worry about stepping on other stuff there? And, and so it kind of gets sticky there. You have a couple of different problems. Now say I'm, I'm done iterating on this. I actually want to commit it. So I have my workflow. Do I just go into my workflow system and change that one? Does it remember that it used to be something else and that yesterday it was a different node that produced that data and today it's a, it's a new node that's producing that same data? Uh, can it even reason about that these nodes are producing data, that they're not just mutating my environment or doing something else. The other thing that we don't really need in a data workflow is a lot of branching or conditionals. You don't generally want to say like, all right, I made it to this stage, now let me look at my environment, and if it says this, I'm gonna use this data, and if it doesn't, I'm gonna use that data. You know, it's unpredictable. How do you know what you're gonna get if you choose your input data at random? There's the aspect of when to run these things. A lot of workflows, you just hit go. Um, it doesn't really have a connotation that we just need to wait for the data to be available at the beginning. Um, say we run this workflow and, and you know, the step on the right fails. Do we have to rebuild everything that we already built on the left? Uh, do you have any checkpointing in there, anything like that? And even more so, like say I had my old version and my new version and I want to have a workflow step that compares those two versions. How, how do you even express that? You know, you, you get into these weird things like, you can't even try that. So we decided to take uh, some of the, the closure concepts that we know and love and apply them to this problem. And that's what we come up with Dagobah. So to start with Dagobah, we start with a single node. So this is a node in our DAG. So what's a node? Node can be a computation. So right now we support Pigpen, obviously. Uh, we support Metacat. It's a thing that we have. It's uh, basically like metadata over S3 data. It kind of looks like a hive table. Um, we have this thing at Netflix called Titan that runs Docker images. Uh, you can run a Python script via the Titan. We run Spark. All, everybody loves Spark in the machine learning area. Um, and we can run Presto queries, which is like a faster version of Hive queries. Really, you could put anything into here. Uh, you get a blob of information that says go run this and you just have to, to ship it off somewhere and run it. The key difference in Dagobah is that each of the nodes has an address. So we've separated the actual computation from the name of what we're building. We'll get into the addressing a little bit more later, but for now you can see it's just, it's just a vector. So we have some keywords and some symbols in there. This one says I'm gonna build a search model uh, for a given date. 
And the way that you ask Dagobah to do something is you issue a request for it. So you say, I want the search model uh, for this given date. And it's going to line it up, and it's going to do some matching based on the, the static parts of that pattern. And says, well, I found this node that can build that pattern. So I, I can build that for you. So it's going to go off, and it's going to run that node, which will produce data. All of our stuff lives in S3 for right now, but there's nothing that says that it has to. And then we end up with this data pointer. See, it's D for data. So we have this data pointer that points to the location of S, uh, the actual physical data in S3, where our job wrote it. And Dagobah will tell you, here's a unique location to write to. It points back to the node that wrote it. So it says, this is the code that we know uh, built this data. And it points back to the address. And it says, you know, this, this was the address of this data. And we remember this. But if we just have a single node, that's not terribly interesting. We don't, we don't have a, a workflow yet. So the way that we do DAGs, essentially, is each of these nodes can specify, I need this input data. So I need some play data. So this might be views of people watch something on Netflix. Um, they might say, oh, here are the things that people searched for on Netflix. So we're going to pass the data in that we got from our user. We're going to issue new requests within the system and say, Dagoba, build this data for me first. So then it goes up the graph. We're going to find some more nodes that, that can satisfy those requests. Find the, the nodes, build the data. It's going to build them at the same time. Say one of them finishes first. So now we have a data pointer. It points to S3, points to the address, points to the node. Now the other one finished. Now we have another piece of data in there. Now we can run our new node 0 that has new dependencies. The important distinction here is that the data pointer for node 0 now points to the ancestor data from node 1 and node 2. It knows the exact piece of data that was used to build node 0. So you, if you go and you're like, why, why was my model all wonky? I, I want to find out. You can actually go back through the, the lineage of the, the data and find the input data, find the code that was run, and then reproduce it. So that's kind of the overall model of Dagoba. Um, it's a little bit different than a workflow because each individual step is kind of issuing a new request. Uh, but that's what it looks like. So we have these node definitions Let's in the addresses. Let's look a little bit closer at that. Of course, we define them in Eden. You know, this is, this is closure, so why not? You have a map that defines what a node looks like. And we're going to give it an output address. So this is the address that we showed in the last slide. And this says the logical address for this node is a search model. I added another parameter in here called model type uh, and date in. So this means that the, the keywords used here are the static parts of the address. The symbols used are the variable parts. So this node is parameterizable by model type and date in. You can say build the model foo for date in today or build the model bar for date in tomorrow. There's a physical address, and this is mapping our different uh, request parameters uh, into a template that can be used to generate an S3 path or some other sort of physical storage path. Um, this is what Dagob is going to use to figure out where to tell the node the actual code that's running, where to write the actual data. We have dependencies. So this is where I'm saying, you know, I, I want to go get this other data first, so give me play data for that date and give me search queries for that date. And just give them friendly names, so when I'm in my, in my code, I can just refer to them by those names. And this is the code to run. So in this case, we're going to run a pig pen script. The script fun function is the entry point into our code. And then exec it says where to run it. Genie is a service that we have at Netflix that executes um, Hadoop jobs of any sort. You can basically just say, Genie, go run this for me, and it'll tell you when it's done. And lastly, we have tags. Tags are applied by the build process. You don't actually specify this when you're writing one of these, but it ends up looking like this once it gets built. Um, and what this does, we have it integrated with, um, we use stash, but any sort of git repo would work. So we have a build number, and then a branch, and then the, the SHA from the commit. Not just the abbreviated one, but those are hard to fit on slides. So now I have this node in the system. What do I do with it? So we issue a request. So the requests are also in Eden. 
So I would give this blob of Eden to the tag of a service and say, go build me this. I want the data search model foo 2015 11.16. Okay, that's today. So what this is going to do is find that path, line it up, and then say foo is my model type. That dates my date. You can also specify, you know, email me when it's done. It's a generally useful thing to know when something's done building. I can also tell it different things about how I want this to be built. So I can say, you know, I want the, the code to come from the branch master. So I can say for this address, the code has to come from the branch master. I don't want somebody's feature branch getting in my way or, or anything like that. I can also say, you know, for all of the play data that we use, uh, use build 42 exactly, exactly that one. So you can specify uh, different things about the ancestor data as well that you know that this will come into play when building this data. So now let's dig into the node definition a little bit deeper. There's more stuff we can do than just, just running a, a single thing. So we can add secondary outputs. These are useful for, you know, my main thing that I'm building is a search model. But along the way, I might have records that I say, oh, yeah, yeah, this, this doesn't look good. Let's throw this off to the side uh, and deal with it later. So I can kind of have these side outputs, if you will. And what this is doing is it's uh, defining another address for the side output. So I could have another node that's hooked up to do validation on that and say, you know, if this error data that I wrote out becomes too big, yeah, halt the whole process, stop everything. You know, we, we don't want to continue there. Can add virtual parameters into the output. And this is saying something like, I have a model. I'm going to build it for every country out there. Uh, but the output's partitioned by country. So if you know a specific country ID, you can ask for it. And that becomes an addressable piece of data. So I might want to have this node produce a model for all countries in, in the world. But I only have validation that runs in the US. So give me the US chunk of that data so that I can run validation on that. You can add in different kind of default parameters. So these are almost as if I had them in the address. Um, it's just another parameter that I can pass in and say, here's, I, I want this threshold and number of days of history to use. Um, but they have default values. If the requesting user wants to override these, they could ask for a threshold of 0.95 or whatever other value they want and run a different thing, and that would be a different address. Uh, but by default, it comes baked in. The last thing in the output is a, a match type. And this is kind of where we get a sort of branching uh, sort of uh, in here. So you can have two nodes that have the same logical address. Say they both build different models. Uh, but this one builds models foo and bar, and this one builds model baz. So you can have two different sets of codes. And Dagobah is going to do that dispatch based on what's asked for. Uh, if you ask for this model type, it'll give you this node. If it gives you the other one, you get the other. And this is one of the greatest things in here. We don't have another DSL for how to de define your dependencies. It's just closure. So you can drop in whatever arbitrary piece of closure code you want. You can import stuff. You can require stuff. Um, and compute what you want uh, as your dependencies. And this works when the node is requested. So when a user comes in and says, build me this model for this day, we pass those parameters into this. And at that point, we figure out what the dependencies are. And you can have all sorts of expressions to build huge, cool, branchy graphs uh, that look really nice and terse in here. So I have my node definition now. Now what do I do with it? So say I have some code. Th these are files here. So next to my code, I put the node definitions. It's just an Eden file that sits there. Um, you can have many of the different. Eden, or nodes.eden files, um, if you want to break up your node definitions to kind of go along with the different pieces of code that you have. Uh, but at the root of your project, you should have a dagobah.eden file. That's just going to tell it where all the nodes are, what artifacts need to be built, like do I need to build a jar, do I need to build a Docker image. And say for starters, we have this on our laptop. You know it's a laptop because it says laptop. Otherwise, you might not know that that's a laptop. So the laptop builds, the, builds your code. Uh, it builds these artifacts. 
Um, and we have tooling around this. Uh, and it's going to shunt them off to some safe storage for these things, uh, be it S3 uh, for jars, or we'll take a, a Docker image uh, and throw it up in the Docker registry. And then from our laptop, we're going to say, hey, Dagaba, I have these new nodes. And it's going to give it the node definitions. Um, and those node definitions will refer to where those artifacts live. At this point, Dagaba knows everything it needs to to actually run these, these jobs and execute these queries. So you could ask it and say, you know, go build me one of these nodes. Dagaba is going to farm the actual work off to other systems to run a pig pen job or run this Docker image on Mesos cluster somewhere. Under the hood, uh, Dagaba is storing all of this information in Datomic. We use Cassandra under that. Um, I'll talk more about this later. But it's just interesting that that's where we put it. Um, it and because you're, you're probably a sane person, you don't keep all of your code only on your laptop. We actually put it into Git somewhere, you know, have some sort of repo. And so now we've checked in our code. We check in these nodes in the, the Dagobah Eden file uh, along with our code. So now our code has all of this information. We can set up an automated build job. So we use Jenkins to say, you know, anytime I change something in Git, go ahead and build this, push the artifacts out there, and tell Dagobah where it is. So this means I can create a feature branch and make commits to it. And every time I make a commit, it triggers a job that builds everything, puts the artifacts in the right place, tells Dagobah where it is. And then I can just, from my laptop, say, hey, go run this job. Um, you can even use this for long-lived branches. Uh, so we have some A-B tests that we're running where each A-B test is just a different branch of master. Um, and you, you can really manage stuff like that nicely. So what are some of the cool things that come out of modeling the world this way? Oops. Say I have a node here. Um, in these next couple of slides, I'm going to gloss over the way that we use a request to actually trigger a node. It's just going to say the little blue box is the request in, in the way of getting to the node. So here we're going to issue a request that, it, that triggers this node, and that node triggers some other nodes. And so we have our graph built up. So say we issue this request, and this is what we deem that we need to build. And then we go through, and we build the data. Again, D for data. And then so we go on to the next stage, and we start building some more data. And oops, that, that one failed. Yeah, so at this point, a lot of uh, traditional workflow systems, you'd have to start all over. Uh, but we don't. We have a checkpoint of view. We know we built this data already. So when we issue the request again, it just goes up to the parts that we need. It finds the existing data. And it can continue to build it, happily just building the last two stages. Then once we're done, all of this lives forever uh, in Dagoba. We have knowledge of that data. So this allows us to do some other cool things, like structural sharing. So say I have this node. And I'm going to issue a request for it. And that's going to go out, and it builds a bigger and bigger graph. And so it starts building data. And lo and behold, somebody comes in and asks for node 1. So do I have to start building it over? No, of course not. It's the same thing. So we can use that existing in-flight request and, and attach to that, in a sense. And so when this is built, then node 1 is satisfied. We can tell that user, your data has been produced. Everything is good in the world and continue on moving uh, down the chain to build node 0. So now we have all of that in the system. So now we can add in a new node. Say I want to do something different, but kind of similar. So I add in a new node 7. I issue a request for it. That goes up here. I'm using the same inputs as node 0. I just need node 1 and 2 again. But lo and behold, I have that data. So I can just use that again. And now I can use that and just immediately compute node 7. So now we've shared the data from the earlier computations. So now where it gets really cool is say I found a bug in node 6, and I need to fix it. And I have a version 2 of node 6. But I want to see you know, what's the difference after my bug fix. right? So I add this new node to the graph. You can see there's v2 up at the top of there. And now I can issue a request and say, give me node 0, but build it with node 6 v2. Alter my dependency up in the graph. So that's going to go and issue the requests. And on one side, it's going to find data, 
because node one has nothing to do with node six. So that satisfies the request because it, there's no restriction on the data. But node two, the data that was built there was using node six v one, so that's not going to work. So we go up the graph, do the same thing. Node five works. Um, then we go off to node six v two, issue that request. We build that data. And now we can build a different version of node 2 using a different input. And this is a, a, an important distinction here, is that Dagobin knows the difference between these two no different versions of node 2. It, they're both using the same node 2 code. They both have similarly named inputs, but they're, they're different uh, actual addresses within the system. We, we can distinguish between these two things and reason about them differently. So then similarly, we come down. We can do the same thing for node 0. It's using this new version of node 2. And now we satisfy the request. Now we have two pieces of data. So if I had another node that could take two copies of node 0 and compare them, we could attach that to the bottom of this. And the data would be there ready and waiting for it. And so now, basically what we've built is, is a big persistent data structure that's just lazily evaluated. You know, as we ask it to do stuff, it's going to build stuff and keep it there forever and remember where it is. And the memory is important because, say, I have a big complex graph. You know, I can't even tell where these lines go anymore. And so I have this node 6v1. I was like, no, that was really bad. I, I need to just cut it out of the system and excise anything that, that came from it. You know, fruit of the poison tree. So let's, let's kill node 6v1. But then we can ripple that change down through and say, all right, anything that was built from that has to go to. Anything that comes out of that is marked as bad. And similarly and so forth, you, you work your way down. And that way, if somebody comes along looking for one of these other pieces of data, what it's going to do is now rebuild it. And it will rebuild the whole chain that's required, but using version 2 of node 6. So you get the correct data there. So persistent data structures are great, but we live in the, the real world. So sometimes you know stuff goes wrong, but you want to say, okay, you know, just do it anyway. You know, fudge it. Um, so we have a concept called gates, and this would sit kind of next to a node or has nodes as inputs and outputs. So we have a gate. So we have an input comes from another another node or data address. You know. And the idea with a gate is you have some validation that would run on the output of the node and say, you know, this looks okay or it doesn't look okay. And if it doesn't look okay, we kick it out to the user. We send you an email and say, hey, this, is, this looks bad, uh, but it's your call. Um, and then the user can respond and say, no, I think that's okay. Go ahead and allow it through. Uh, or no, uh, stop it. If you know, you just, it kills the whole process. If it says yes, it basically just copies the input through to the output. Um, have a concept of a fallback. Uh, so this says, you know, if today's model looks bad, then just immediately go to yesterday's model uh, if I say no, because I still want to have data there for, for the graph purposes. Another thing that, that we're working on, haven't built quite yet, is a thing we're calling actions. Here we have a simpler uh, node, has a model, and then a, a date that goes along with it. So say I request the model for today, and then I request the model for tomorrow, and then the next day, and these things are building up because say there's a data is not available yet for the 16th, and then the 17th relies on that too, and the 18th, uh, they all rely on the last couple of days of history. So that you get these requests stacking up, you know, and Dagob is just going to patiently wait until the data is available and then start building them. So then you run into this problem, say the data all shows up at once, it starts building all of these things. That's great, you know, you get the concurrency. Uh, but in the real world, we might have a cache that we need to update and actually take these things uh, and put them into a cache and, and change some mutable store at the, at the bottom of our graph. So the, the idea of an action is to serialize these uh, and make sure that they go in order. So we get the 16th, goes to the action, says, yay, all right, we finally have data. Let's put it in the cache. And we have the 18th, says, okay, that's greater than the 16th. Let's put it in the cache. And the 17th comes along, the 17th is less than the 18th, it says, nope, can't do that, uh, and it blocks it. And the way that we do this is we just define a comparator over the different model parameters. So this is something the user would specify. 
19th comes along, we can publish that, and all is good in the world. Um, this also enforces that only one of these is happening at once. So even if the 17th comes in slightly before the 18th, we don't want them both writing the cache at the same time. So under the hood, I mentioned earlier we used Atomic. Um, you don't need to understand anything on this slide. It was just more of a cool graphic than anything. Um, but the way that we modeled this is, is kind of roughly uh, analogous to like a RETI algorithm. So we have the information that Dagobah knows about the world, uh, and then you have different user inputs. So the user input might be add this node, add this request, cancel this request, or update the status of this. Then each of those is translated into datomic datums. So I take a node and I translate it into the, the datomic representation of that. Uh, it might be a status update, it's like use an entity reference and then change the status. You know. And then I take my existing data and I say, all right, add this new transaction data and give me a new what if database. And then I have a bunch of these rules that say, all right, if this and this, then that. So an example of these rules, we call them elaboration rules, uh, might be if I have a request and I have a node and it doesn't have a job running, go ahead and create the job. Uh, if there's a job with no active attempts, then go ahead and create the attempt. And each one of those would be a decoupled rule. So what we do is we just recursively apply and apply and apply all of these rules until they give us nothing more, until we've bottomed out in this tree. Then we have this big set of datums. We say, all right, take this whole thing, commit the whole thing, uh, and then we run some queries at the end and say, all right, based on all that we know now about the world, uh, what jobs do we need to start? Uh, what users do we need to notify that the jobs are done? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. You can kind of see the different, this is a different state transition diagram. So like if I add data, then I need to do this rule. And after that, I can do this query. So that limits the number of different things that we need to evaluate on each pass. Makes it more efficient. Um, there are things that, that I love about Datomic. Like it's, it's awesome that we can express each of these rules as a function that takes a database value and does a query on that in the, in the function uh, and then returns the transaction data. So it's awesome that we can write queries as Eden. Um, unfortunately, we can't store the data as Eden. Uh, you have to manually serialize that. So there are still a couple of rough edges around it. Um, one thing that we love is that you can do the go forward in time thing. So you can say, I have this database. Now what if this, and it gives me a new database. Um, if I screwed up something last week, I can say, you know, go back in time, and what was the, the database value at that time. Unfortunately, they don't work together, so you can't go back in time and then go forward in time. Um, but I'm, I'm sure they're working on all these things. All in all, it works great for us because we're modeling a persistent graph structure and a data storage that is a persistent graph structure. So they, they play well together. One of the nice things, too, about this is because after everything that we do, we store it back to Datomic, you can literally unplug uh, Dagobah and walk away for days and then plug it back in, and it'll resume running exactly the same jobs and the same workflows. Uh, there's no state in the actual Dagobah service whatsoever. So we do actually use this in production at Netflix, um, not for all of Netflix yet. Uh, but we do use it for a lot of things. Um, uh, right now, uh, we're processing about 200 user requests every day. So that sounds small, but this is actually 200 data pipelines that it's running every day. And so these data pipelines might span hours or days or, or long times. In the end, it ends up running about 1,000 jobs every day. Um, we have 13,000 node definitions uh, with about 200 unique addresses in the system. Uh, and what this means is that people iterate. They iterate a lot. Uh, so you have the same node and then all my different copies of it while I was trying stuff out. And all my different copies of it can share data with the existing production system. And as a result of this, right now we have about 60,000 pieces of data that it knows in, in the system. We've been running it maybe six months at, at this rate. So it's, it's accreting very quickly. But it seems to be holding up. Um, I'm sure someone will ask, are we going to open source this? Uh, yes, we do have plans to open source this, make it public um, when it's done. <laughs> so. 
That's what I've got. We are hiring. If you're interested in working at Netflix and building cool stuff like this.